So, I thought I would um, do a bit of a video about um, the jam box uh, tonight. Um, there was a bit of a, a thread on on Reddit about um, about how the example code for the uh, sequencer um, was supposed to work. It certainly doesn't do what you would um, think it does from um, a cursory read of the code, and I'm pretty sure that it doesn't do what um, the person who wrote the code wanted it to do <laughs> either. But um, I haven't gotten quite as far as um, doing all the an analysis required to get it to run the way it, it probably should. But anyways, um, let's get started. Okay, we're going to take a first pass through this I2S example that comes from the uh, ESP32 I IDE inter integrated development environment. Anyways, um, they have some examples on how to use the various peripherals that are inside the ESP32 chip. This comes straight from those examples. So, pretty straightforward to begin with. We include some libraries that we're going to need. We define some variables, sample rate, which um, I2S uh, device we're going to be attaching to, the frequency of our wave, and a constant pi. Our samples per cycle is the sample rate divided by the wave frequency. So sample rate is samples per second, and wave frequency is cycles per second, so this is samples per cycle, dimensional analysis. Um, I don't know if they even teach that in computer science. So, the first thing we have to do is configure our um, two things. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's what, why they were in there, because I was starting to do some work on I'm reading the uh, reading the pots, but I'm not reading the pots anymore um, for this example. So unsigned int i and sample val ints are 32 bit in, and we've also got sample value, which is an unsigned int. We've got some floats, sine triangle. The triangle step is this is an important note that they make right here for a 36 kilohertz sample rate. 36,000 hertz and a 100 hertz sine wave every cycle needs 360 samples 4 bits per sample so using 6 buffers 60 samples per buffer will allow us to store those 360 times 4 bytes that's how they calculate this buffer size it's important, and we'll see why later. Well, I might as well explain it now. The, the length of this buffer is what gets filled by um, uh, your code, and if that buffer is left empty or it, it overflows, it will affect the sound because you aren't putting the... because um, that buffer gets read from asynchronously from what's happening in your program. You can fill that buffer up, and then Outside, it will continuously lead, read from that buffer. Not doesn't matter what you're doing in your program; you can be off doing something else. But what's in that buffer will be read from continuously over and over. It doesn't erase the buffer; it just keeps reading through it. So that's what happens there. Now, bits per sample, 16. So sorry, yeah. Although these are unsigned ints and these are 32 bits, we're only going to be using 16 bits per sample, and so that's what we're going to use to try and figure out which bits we can trim and and whatnot. Um, so we are using um, right and then left in terms of which order are we sending our bytes down. So two bytes for the left channel, uh, right channel, and then two bytes for left. The communication format is I2S and the communication format of um, I2S is least significant bit. Um, this didn't come this way from originally. It came with MSB, but we can, um, we can leave it as LSB for now because it actually works that way. Because of how the uh, the DAC is set up, and we don't have a way of changing the DAC to expect um, least significant or most significant bit first, we have to do it this way. All right, um, and then we um, we're going to be using interrupts later, so we um, set 
up our I2S to be able to trigger interrupt. So when the buffer fills, we can get an interrupt. Now, configuring our pins, 26, 25, 22, and 20 are going to be the uh, pins that we're using for our I2S. Um, so now, we initialize flash, we install the I2S driver, and then we uh, do uh, our set up our pins. We set our triangle float to negative 32,676. And why are we doing that? Because the triangle wave is going from negative 32,767 all the way up to positive 32,765 or 768. Anyways, all the way around. And then it goes up and then it goes down. Up. And that's why we start it there. Now, for i equals 0, i equals number of samples per cycle, and then increment afterwards, we're going to calculate the sine of i times pi divided by 180. What's all this mean? Um, that's that um, stuff we were talking about earlier um, in terms of how do we digitize our sine wave. So first of all, we calculate the sine at each of our sample points. i goes from up to the number of samples per cycle. If um, we're bigger than zero, then we're going to add our triangle step. So when sine is positive, we're going to be going up the um, triangle. And when sine is negative, we're going to be going down the triangle because we're subtracting triangle steps. So we count up and then count down as sine goes. That's where it goes like this and like that. Um, All right, so that's doing the triangle. Now um, we start at zero. We add triangle float to our sample value, and then we left shift our um, sample over by 16 bits, and then we add our um, truncated sine value to our sample value. So what we're doing is we are first of all storing four, uh, sorry, two bytes for the triangle flow. So that's a short int, which is 16. Putting that in sample value, left shifting it over, and then storing our float value for our sign. Remember, our sign is short, so it's also going to be 16 bits, so it's going to fit in the sign sample area. So that's how we're constructing our sample and then we're going to push that sample out to our um, I squared C device. And how do you do that? Tell it which number you want, which device you're pushing it to, and then a pointer to what the um, data is. And so I'm pushing it to this sample val. And so every time I go through this loop, I'm going to push a sample onto the um, into the buffer, and then um, I'm not going to time out because it's running fast enough. Um, now, this is all in something called void app main. It runs only once, right? Inside of an app main, um, when you're programming in the uh, I, in, t in the uh, ESP32 IDE, you're, you're programming in C++ straight up. Sorry, C. This I'm writing this in C. So e you don't have the, the luxuries of your Arduino style um, setup and and uh, loop. You have to take care of those things yourself. So really, all of this is happening in setup, and then the processor is sitting idle. So what this code is doing is it's storing a collection of samples that represent a triangle wave on the left cha right channel and a, a sine wave on the left and sitting, setting that stuff up into the buffer and then it's going to run, it's going to reread that buffer, it's going to send that buffer out to the ADC continuously. Sorry, the DAC continuously. And let's just compile that.
and see what that sounds like. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, since I... Since I took out that library, I don't have any of these, the, the blah, 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 yeah, yeah, so, anyways, here we go. Compiling, yabbity, yabbity. Okay, so what we're looking at and listening to is the results of our um, sketch that's been modified from the examples directory in um, the ESP32 ESP32 ID, IDF, Integrated Development Framework, um, set of examples. So the only thing that we changed in the code is to change it from sending most significant bit to least significant bit um, first. And uh, that's something you can do in the, in the driver. We saw that with the, uh, we saw that on the, uh, on the code. And um, that produces a nice continuous tone. If we reflash with using most significant bit, Shuts off. It's uploading. And we will get something very different. You can see that there is still a semblance of a sine wave in there, but um, it's piecewise sine wave and it's getting all chunked up. And the reason it's getting chunked up is because um, you've got your bits in the wrong order. And uh, so, yeah, that's what, uh, what that looks like when you make that change. The other, the other way of fixing that, of course, is the way the other people have fixed it, and that is to um, take um, the, uh, what do we call it, what is that, I think it's the DN line, and then that can be um, uh, put over to a pin here, and then you can toggle that pin up and down so that this thing is expecting either most significant bit or least significant bit. No, not DN, L clock, LCK, or FMT. Anyways, one of those pins. Um, that's another way. Of, that's another way of doing it. And that's what that looks like. And that's what that sounds like. What does the left channel look like? That looks like a triangle wave. And so in the places where sine is positive, it's going up, and the places where sine is negative, it's going down. So why don't I just get... Oh yeah, that's definitely... Craptacular connections that are causing that. All right, let's get another probe on there, and then we can see the two of them side by side. So now we've got uh, a blank um, project to load our code into. Okay, let's just throw that in there and see what we get. Uh, what doesn't it like? Oh, right, I haven't installed the LED matrix libraries. Okay, so in Platformio, what you need to do is to add a library that isn't um, defy, uh, added um, globally is create inside of your lib directory um, a subdirectory that has the same name as the library itself, and that's how it will parse it. You can 
get that from here. So lib bar foo foo c foo h bar source bar. So you can either have um, a source directory or you can just have a subdirectory that's the same name as your um, library. But at the top level underneath your libraries folder, you need to have um, the name of your library. Inside of that name of your library, you can either have doc examples and then a source subdirectory that includes your library name, or you can do it this way. So I've done it this way. So now go back to here, see what else I've got wrong. LED matrix one. Didn't like. Oh, I didn't. Doesn't look like anything. Looks like it's compiled. So yeah, and that should be um, uploading to our hacker box. And now let's see what that thing looks like when we start playing with it and what it sounds like. What it sounds like. They certainly don't sound like sine waves, do they? They sound very un-sine wave-like, in fact. I mean, it is producing something. But the sounds don't really have very much variability to them and whatnot. So there's, there's, some, there's some bogusness going on with that code, for sure. So let's investigate that. Bogosity. So the first place I'm going to look is to try and see if it's this old problem right here. Let's build that. Send it up there and see what we get this time. Okay, so to begin with, um, number of devices for the matrix, or LED matrix, and defines up here, FS, FS, sample rate in hertz. Okay, sample frequency, um, fair enough, somebody, sample length, I was just going to say that somebody likes to put their prepositions before the verb, but, uh, okay, I, I don't care. Pi 2, okay, so we're going to be multiplying by pi 2 always and never pi, so why not define a constant? Saves us a multiplication, fair enough. Do some initialization of the LED matrix, um, define which port we're going to be using, set up that port, okay, so sample rate is 16, bits per sample is 16, um, communication format, well, I've already set that to LSB because we know we need to do that. Buffer count 8 by 64. Okay, so there's going to be an 8 by 64 bit buffer. Um, what is that actually going to mean? We'll see when we get to later, and then we define our pins. Okay, we define wavetables. Remember in this sketch, the Jambox synth? Um, what we were doing here was we were generating essentially values of sine and the triangle wave that we're going to send out through our buffer on the fly. In the Jambox sequencer, what they do is they set up wavetables because we've got those eight buttons along the uh, side and we're going to assign a, a sound to each of those buttons by defining a wavetable. And that wavetable is going to store our sample len um, samples. 
So each of these wavetables is going to have a hundred subsamples of that wave in the table. Fair enough. We'll see why this isn't necessarily a great idea, but now the setup, we install our driver just like before. Right? I to us give it the config, give it the port number that we're going to be talking to it, zero and null. Port number, zero and null. Install and start the I2S driver. Set the pins up. Set the pins up. Pin config. And then set the sample rates. Okay, fair enough. Um, we didn't do that. Did we do that? No, we weren't setting a sample rate right here. And that might be needed for something elsewhere, but in any event. So, load wavetable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is indexing which um, wavetable we're going to be using and then what frequency we're going to be storing in here. Now, <laughs> this is just a, an aside, but these are the only two frequencies that make any sense musically. None of these correspond to any musical notes that I know of. Um, they correspond to a sound, a frequency of sound, but they're not in a pentatonic scale, for one thing. Um, and I don't even know if they're in a, in a diatonic scale because they don't match any of the sharps or flats in the pentatonic scale. So I, I just don't know where they came up with these numbers. It would be interesting. Um, I might be missing something. This could make perfectly good sense, but um, it, uh, anyways, we'll leave it at, at that. Okay, so now we've got these pins for our, um, two, three, see, that's all of our, our buttons for the wavetables. And then these are our analog reads. These are the analog values of the five pots. Fair enough. Okay, so there's some nonsense that goes into setting up um, our display grid. And so when a button is pressed and a column is at a certain point, it will store that in this um, grid state. And then as we're going through the grid state, we can read which LEDs are lit and such like. So that's what that does, All right? And then as we're going right, void loop. Remember, we're in an Arduino environment, so we've got um, some setup to do, and we've got a loop that we're going to execute. So this is going to loop over and over and over. So we, um, we read the grid state, and we read our pots, and based on the value of our pot, we are going to adjust the how fast we play things, and then um, then we're going to update our display and then we're going to increment to the next column. And then if we get bigger than 32, we go back to the beginning. So we just loop around. So that's all that does. Intro scroll, yada yada. Read inputs, do the digital read on those buttons and our pots. It's pretty straightforward. Now, set the bit col column mask and column boot. Uh, block balance, so sets an LED column for the bottom up, so this is what sets up all of our different, our LED array. If a button was pressed, it'll, it'll illuminate that and store it in our matrix so that we can illuminate the LEDs as it goes by. Now, here are where they're creating their wavetables. Load wavetable, channel, and then frequency. So remember up here, I was on a little bit of a rant about this. These are the different channels. These are the different frequencies. So let's take a look at a spreadsheet, and I'll show you why this looks kind of weird. And Okay, so this is what the wavetables are going to contain after um, after we're done with them. Well, <clears throat> not exactly this. This is just the raw signs. I haven't done any of the um, the scaling. This is just where it's starting with. And you'll notice that each of these, well, I'm calling them frequencies because 
This is what's in the table. 440 and 494 are the only two that correspond to an actual note in a scale. The other ones um, don't correspond to um, a, a normal note. For example, the C above uh, middle C is 523 hertz, not 555, and middle C is, oh sorry, these are A4s. No, oh, those are, that's not middle C, that's, that should be four, sorry. All of these should be um, fours. So that should be C4, which is middle C. Middle C is 262, not 264. D above middle C, 294 instead of 297. So I'm not sure where these numbers came from, but in any event, it's not material. <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about is how these wave tables are going to get generated. Now, easy, all of these have a fixed length, 100 samples. Each wave table has 100 samples in it. But when you're trying to string some of these wave tables together and play them repeatedly, what you're going to end up with is discontinuities over here because the wave table always restarts here. Unless you do something clever and unwind this wave table, but I don't see them doing anything clever in the code. All we're going to get is some partial sine wave and then a discontinuity as, as it repeats. So it's just, um, yeah, that's, that's basically what our problem is with, my problem is with that wave table generation. There are other ways to go about it. You could do it on the fly because the ESP32 is pretty fast, but um, and, yeah. Let's just leave it at that. That's what the code's doing. I'm not 100% sure that that code makes sense. Okay, yeah, so this little transform makes things everything shift all up here and then if we finally we lift shift that over 12 bits that's the same thing as multiplying 2 to the 12th oh yeah that just makes it swing between just under 30,000 Sorry, 300,000 up to 700,000. So, now, <laughs> let's take a, a look at how that actually happens in the code. So remember, we're loading a wavetable. We've got an int and a cha our channel, so depending on which wavetable we're loading, and then we've got our frequency. So, how'd that work again? 2 pi times f divided by the um, uh, sample frequency. Frequency divided by sample frequency times 2 pi, that's going to be equal to the in interval that a single sample um, occupies in time. Because this is, F is frequency, cycles per second, divided by samples uh, what was that again? Sample frequency. So samples per second. So when you divide samples, or sorry, cycles per second by samples per second, you are left with um, samples per second. Did I get that right? This is cycles per second divided by, no, that is cycles per sample cycles per sample. So this is what portion of a uh, cycle is going to be in each sample. Okay, remember that. So sample length um, is, uh, that's going to be 100 in our case, if, that's how long the sample is going to be. So zero to sample length, increment after we're done the loop. So we define sample as a float, so we take our sign. So this is which um, 
portion of our sample, which sample are we working on, and then multiply that by the fraction of a cycle that the sample occupies, right? Cycles per second. Samples per second gives us cycles per sample. And then we expand that um, by multiplying by 60, and then we um, shift that so because we want to be working with um, unsigned integers, so we're going to shift this up because sine goes from negative 1 to 1. So now this is going from negative 60 to 60, so now we have to shift up that whole thing, 128. So now it goes from uh, z zero, no, eight to, wait, eight to, it's not even shifting up, no, it actually goes higher, sorry, it goes up to, um, it goes from uh, 68 up to 1, 88. Did I do that right? So the largest it can be is 60, so the largest that these can be is 168, uh, sorry, 188, and the smallest that this can be is negative 60, so when I add it to that, the smallest that that can be is 68. So it goes from 68 to 188. And then what we do is we throw away the decimal portion of this value so that we're dealing with strictly an integer. Now our integer is in our Duino int and I think those are 16 bits or are they eight? Yeah, I think they're 16 bits. But since this is going, this is maxing out at 188, um, we only need eight of those bits, or six of those bits. This is only six bits big, and so this left shifts by um, 12 bits, and so that gives us our 18 bits with our most significant bit on the left-hand side. Fair enough. But, as you saw on the graph, this sample contains a non- uniform number of waveforms. So if we're repeatedly streaming out this waveform, we're going to get discontinuities at when it when it wraps around. And that's bad if we want to have a continuous tone coming out of it at the same frequency. Now, if you don't want to have a continuous tone coming out of it at, at the same frequency, then that's fine. But um, that doesn't look to me to be what they're trying to do here. Okay, it's producing something, but I wouldn't exactly call it all that regular. And it's certainly not a sine wave, which is what the code would lead you to believe that is going to be produced. Um, it's definitely not that, and we can go into some details about why. So, a wavetable should store one cycle of data. So, in order to do that, our data structure would be somewhat similar to an array, except it has a preferred um, element at the front of the array that will tell you how long they're... well, you don't actually have to do that because you just use the len function of an array. But anyways, you could store the number of samples. So number of samples in it, and then all the way up to the end. So when you're generating this array, it will have exactly one cycle of your wave in it. So that it starts and finishes at the same point, so when you tack another one of these on, it produces a continuous wave. So that's the first thing I would try and modify to try and see if we can get this, this uh, program making any sense whatsoever. So 
And now it doesn't have to store just one. It could store multiple um, integer. It could store integer multiples of this wave, and that would be fine. But it has to be an integer multiple so that you can just tack them together and play them continuously in order to produce a, a, uh, a continuous tone. Otherwise, you have to, f if you've got this wave here, something that looks like here's what we're digitizing in our in our sample, we have to, when we play this the next time, we have to start at the same point uh, on our on our wave, so we have to start here for our next portion, so we've got an overlap happening. It just makes no sense. It's a crazy way of, of doing it. So, um, you can use, either use the length of the array, or you could use the um, or you could use um, a prefer uh, a starting length in your first value of your of your array for s how many samples are in that array. That's the first step that I would do, and then um, take it from there. So yeah, maybe I'll do some of that um, later, but um, for now I think that that's more than enough for the evening, and hopefully this has been helpful or illustrative, or it. Um, just made you mad in which case sorry about that but anyways yeah thanks for watching and bye for now